What's up, my wizards? It's Dev from SBMTG on the YouTube.com down there. We like magic, and today I've got something I've been working on for a while now. This will be a guide to the Frontier format. Never heard of Frontier? Don't worry, you're not alone. A lot of players haven't, but there's also a lot of players who are really interested in this new format because it's basically an extension of Standard, which sounds familiar. I think I've heard a YouTuber talk about that before. Anyway, with all the hullabaloo about Frontier lately, I figured it was about time to put out a Frontier guide, both for players interested in this new format, it's pretty exciting, and for players who have never heard of it. So what we're going to do in this video is define Frontier format for those people, and for everybody, talk about what the best decks in this format right now are. That said, you won't see me for too much of this video, which I know I'm sad, I'm super handsome and all, but I'm going to take the rest of this time here to tell you that you can look in the description for all of these deck lists, including lands and sideboards, which I won't go into too much in this video, but again, full deck lists in the description, including a wealth of articles that I've found very helpful when figuring out what the Frontier format actually is and what the best decks are. So a lot of stuff in the description, make sure you check all of that out. But first thing I want to do here is again define what exactly Frontier is. Hi, voiceover dev here to answer the question, what is Frontier format. Well, Frontier is basically a brand new Magic the Gathering format that includes all sets from Cons of Tarkir onward, including M15, the core set. At present, this is only a small extension of the standard format, but the notable exception is that this is an eternal format, which is to say that it doesn't rotate, and any sets that come out from now on will just add to the list of playable sets. Now when you're interested in playing in any format, it can often be helpful to begin by finding out what the best decks in that format are. You don't have to select a top tier deck to play with, you don't have to be that guy if you have a problem with that guy, but it's always very helpful to know what you're most likely to be playing against on the other side of the board. So with that in mind, we're going to look at the top 8 decks in the format. But the last thing I want to remind everybody here before I actually start talking about decks, is that again the format is in no way solved and that there's no number one deck in the format and each of the decks we're going to talk about today only account for about 5% of the format each, meaning that about 60% of the format is wide open currently. Now again, there is no number one deck in the format, so these are in no particular order, but I want to start with what I believe to be, based on the data, the most popular aggro deck in the format, and that is currently Jeskai Aggro. Now this is mostly due to the return of the ultra-powerful Monastery Swift Spear, one of the best one-drops of all time, seriously. This deck plays a package of 13 one-drop creatures, all of which are human by the way, which makes Thalia's Lieutenant a very effective piece in the two-drop slot. But despite all of those one-drops, the deck plays more three-drops than your average aggro deck, which is okay because all of those three-drops have the potential to be game-ending, whether Manus Rider comes in swinging, or Reflector Mage sets up a pivotal attack step, or Reckless Bushwhacker pushes our damage output over the top. Wild Slash and Lightning Strike return as excellent burn pieces that can get creatures out of the way or deal extra damage to close the game. Always Watching is no is great, always, no matter when it comes down. And Knight of the White Orchid is pivotal in this deck, very important card, because it fills out the 2-drop slot, is a human, and lets us play fewer lands because we can go get that 3rd mana that we need to cast those 15 3-drops. Now, there are 18 lands in this deck, dangerously low, right? But we're playing a lot of one drops and Knight of the White Orchid, which mitigates our land count considerably. But one good thing about this mana base, by the way, is that even though there are a lot of fears from a lot of players that the presence of fetch lands is going to make this format very, very, very expensive, this deck actually only plays two. It plays two Flooded Strand, and that is all. And that really helps out the budget because this deck is only going to cost you around $150 to build. Not that bad. The second deck I want to talk about today is Bant Eldrazi. Now, a recurring theme that you'll notice throughout this video is that a lot of these decks look eerily similar to Cons of Tarkir standard decks, but this is definitely one of the notable exceptions. This deck is instead a very similar variant on the Bant Eldrazi deck that is currently pretty important in modern. Thought Not Seer, Reality Smasher, and Drowner of Hope are all hard to deal with creatures, and two of them can be profitably blinked with Eldrazi Displacer, along with Eldrazi Sky Spawner, and the one of Verderous Gear Hulk, which is hilarious. This deck has an intensely high threat density and performs well at most stages of the game, with Elvish Mystic to speed things up early and Tamiyo and Nissa as one ofs for late game card advantage. There's a lot of aggro in this format, but if this deck can get to the mid game, it'll quickly outclass the fast decks with its four and five drops. 
Most of this 24 land mana base is pretty affordable, if somewhat screwy, you'll notice. The Windswept Heaths are the most important cards, but picking those up will allow you access to, you know, a lot of decks in Frontier and Modern and sort of even Legacy, so pick up these Windswept Heaths. Here's another deck that could easily be the number one deck in the format. This is Four Color Rally. Now, if this deck looks really, really familiar, that's because it was the best deck in Standard just before Shadows Over Innistrad came out. The strategy is still strong and reliable. Sacrifice your creatures to Nantuko Husk, get drains off Azulaport of Cutthroat, return them all with Rally Ancestors, and do it again at instant speed. Both Rally and Collected Company can be played on your opponent's combat step or at the end of their turn for just maximum annoyance. And there are plenty of ETB effects to go around. We get Reflector Mage and Spell Queller, by the way, and Jason Elvis Visionary are there to draw cards and keep things moving. Overall, this deck is still a well-oiled machine and runs smoothly because of its nice curve. One cool thing is that we really keep our opponent on their toes and force them to respect and play around all of our instant speed tricks. Now these 24 lands will form one of the most expensive mana bases that we'll look at all day and this does validate some players fears because we're playing a whole 12 fetches but they're there for a reason. This being a four color deck we're stretching the mana base to its limit so the fetch lands take a lot of the pressure off. The fourth deck I want to touch on today is Mono Red Goblins. It's back. I mean, this is basically almost a word-for-word -word remake of the Goblins deck from Origin Standard, and it hasn't gotten any less powerful. You know, 20 Goblins, including Pile Driver and Rabble Master in the same deck together, plus Dragon Fodder and the excellent Hordling Outburst. If you've forgotten how good Hordling Outburst was, the card is ridiculous, which they both, by the way, work very, very well with both Pile Driver and Rabble Master. And they also work really, really stupidly well with the unfair Stoke the Flames, and Obelisk Covert is even still here to give us a huge boost to these Gabos. Now the 20 land mana base here is really the cheapest in the format, by far. Just get together 20 basic mountains and you're done. So that's all. Um, this contributes, by the way, to the fairly low budget of the deck. It's the lowest budget of any deck that we'll look at all day. It's going to cost you just about 50 bucks to build this thing, which is a steal, and the deck is still super fun to play and can win whole tournaments in Frontier by itself. The fifth deck we'll look at here is Dark Jess Guy. Again, it's back. This deck is also very similar, again, to a heavily played deck from Origin Standard, except it adds Collective Brutality and Painful Truths in the spell base. But the best addition here, by far, is certainly the one of Torrential Gear Hulk, which can recast Crackling Doom or Ojutai's Command. But the absolute best thing for Torrential Gear Hulk to recast in this whole format is Dig Through Time, which can lead to a crazy amount of value mana wise. Now, you wouldn't think that Delve would work well with Torrential Gear Hulk, but if you've delved away everything in your graveyard, and the only thing down there now is a dig through time, <laughs> Gear Hulk is more than happy to cast that again. Again, it's probably the best card that you can recast with a Torrential Gear Hulk, so there's that. Jace and Soulfire Grandmaster, the old Grandmaster's back, and Manus Rider, I mean, <laughs> just rounding out a list of super high power format staples that this deck is loaded with. The mana base, by the way, is intensely varied, if you didn't notice, by this chart here. It has everything from fetches to shadow lands to tri lands and creature lands, but another four color mana base, so this is the type of variance that's expected and necessary. The sixth deck that I'll talk about today is Abzan, which you knew had to rear its ugly head at some point. The deck still plays all the pieces that made it a standard Scourge for a really long time, you know. Anafenza and Siege Rhino are still the backbone of the creature base, and we still have overpowered spells too, you know, Dramoka's Command, Abzan Charm, just all-star spells, but the deck also finds room for a few pieces it didn't previously have access to, like Tireless Tracker, Collector Brutality, there's that again, and Grim Flayer in a lot of these lists. You would think that the deck would want Smuggler's Copter, but a lot of these lists are going to play Sky Sovereign to add to its large repertoire of mid-game threats. To be clear, though, I will say that sometimes these Abzan decks will add Elvish Mystic and Smuggler's Copter instead of Sky Sovereign or Grim Flayer, so there is some amount of variance to the way Abzan is built in this format. This 24 land mana base here is again full of fetches, but if you don't have the dough for those, you could easily have decent alternatives in Hissing Quagmire and Shambling Vent, which would still work pretty well, but the fetches make everything run really, really smooth. 
The seventh deck I want to look at, and the eighth, by the way, are both decks that are quirky and really, really cool and amazingly are very important in the format right now. Number seven is Green Black Elves. Hey, guys. Now, here is an interesting deck. Like most elf decks from 2015, it's based around Shaman of the Pack, and this version actually plays Woodland Bellower, so it can go get a Shaman of the Pack. That's really cool. Um, but it ditches Collected Company, which is a surprise, but it does so in favor of another Four mana spell, Panharmonicon. Now, if you thought one Shaman of the Pack ETB trigger was good, wait until you get two at once. And if that weren't enough, you can also get double the ETB triggers off of Elvish Visionary, Dwinin's Elite, Sylvan Messenger, which is really dirty, and even more. There's a lot of cool creatures with ETB effects in this deck. And the whole idea is basically play, you know, we've got a pretty good spread, if you haven't noticed, of, of the curve here. You know, we've got good game in the early game, drops on turn one, turn two, turn three, and we've got a good mid game plan that focuses around like courting creatures into play like Shaman of the Pack or even Woodland Bellower into Shaman of the Pack and just dealing butt tons of damage all at one time. The old Green Black Elves deck in um, in the last standard could deal something like eight or nine damage fairly easily in the mid or late game with a Shaman of the Pack. Imagine doing basically your opponent's entire life total because of Panharmonicon with Shaman of the Pack. That's just silly. Now the 21 land mana base here is fairly simple because we're only playing two colors and it doesn't include fetch lands and that makes this one of the most budget decks that we'll look at actually. It's just over about $100 to build this thing right now. And also note the awesome decision to play Westvale Abbey in there as a two of with 30 creatures. It's a great in game option. And the last deck that we'll talk about is actually probably the one that I would sleeve up if I was going to go to a Frontier uh, tournament. This one is In Soul, and it's four colors now, you know? The cool thing about this one is that it's, again, not just a straight-up copy of the Blue, Red, and Soul deck from Nick Standard. It's packed a lot of pieces since then, and now takes the form of a four-color aggro deck. It still plays the shell of In Soul Artifact, Shrapnel Blast, and Ghost Fire Blade, but it also now plays Toolcraft Exemplar, Smuggler's Copter, and Unlike license disintegration which is awesome as well as a slew of cards that are super great with shrapnel blast like thraven inspector scrap heap scrounger and hangerback walker uh, one of the weirdest choices in this deck that you'll probably notice the eye is drawn to it is the two of Cambal, which is probably the most jammed in two slots of any deck in the format but that makes sense in a format with crazy removal like lightning strike and wild slash and abzan charm as well as all-star spells like dig through time Cambal seems like a pretty good choice and it's slightly odd to not see ornithopter in there somewhere but the deck functions as well as ever you know drop an artifact early and soul it for f and fly over for five and and then just play blast and get five more damage out of your cheap junk you know walker and scrounger help us go late and with 10 damage turns out of nowhere being pretty common the incidental damage from cabal and disintegration is super dangerous now this deck plays 20 lands and even though it's four colors note that it doesn't play any fetches at all which is crazy we just we, i guess we want to go as fast as possible i think fetches could be part of that plan but apparently it's not and that ultimately by the way is going to keep the budget for this deck pretty low just about 150 dollars to build this really really fun looking contraption hi it's me again now there are other decks in the format but these are just the eight that i felt we're really noteworthy at present. Again, very, very young format. And there's other decks, you know? There's things like Bant Court of Calling right now, Teamer Metallurgic Summonings, Atarka Red. But some of those decks are sort of falling by the wayside, being culled right now in the presence, the rise, really, of Jeskai-based aggro, really red-based aggro. Um, but we see Jeskai decks, we see four-color decks, you know? There are up-and-coming decks, though. You know, there are things like Jund, which is becoming a thing in the format, because Jund is... It always tries to be a thing. Mono White Humans is kind of big right now, you know. Um, so there are, there are other decks, definitely. And any given Sunday, <laughs> you know, a new deck could become the king of the format and solve everything. But it's probably going to be a while before that happens because of how young the format is. And also remember, I've already said this, but you can click the description and get all these deck lists and a bunch of articles that I dug through while learning about Frontier. So if you want to get lost in it, you can. There is a wealth of information in the description box. Don't forget. But I'm tapped out for now. That's all I currently know about the Frontier format. Minus sideboards, but again, click the description if you want to know more about the sideboards. Just... Just click the stupid description. There's a lot of stuff there. But anyway, um, that's all I've got for this one. Leave a comment down there in the sideboard. I'm going to start calling it that now. A lot of people 
thought that was a good idea. <laughs> but leave a comment down there in the sideboard. Um, and let me know not only, you know, how you felt about this video, but anything you have to add to the discussion, we'd be more than willing to listen to. So talk to me down there in the comments section, and don't forget to hit the like button if you enjoyed the video. YouTube has switched their algorithm again. They care more about community engagement, likes, dislikes, comments, and stuff like that. So please leave a like, leave a comment, and hit the bell next to the subscribe button to make sure that you get notifications whenever I put videos out because YouTube's just changing everything. But help me out by doing that stuff, and I will see you guys next time. I'm Dev from SBMTG. Thanks for watching, my wizards.